here. Right. And um, their industry actually uh, became very strong, such that Ukraine, um, by the end of the USSR, uh, you know, sphere of influence with Ukraine, they were the richest uh, country in Eastern Europe. Okay, um, so when the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, Ukraine became independent really for the first time in its entire history. However, you know, it just was completely taken over, just like how Germany, West Germany, it was never really, it never became sovereign after World War II. West Germany was occupied by NATO for 10 years from uh, 1945 until 1955. And they were only given, uh, you know, an illusion of sovereignty or the, you know, the veneer of sovereignty when they joined NATO. So, you know, they, Germany to this day is not a free country. They're beholden to their controllers. And um, so what happened was when the Soviet Union dissolved, part of the disaster of this was Gorbachev's perestroika, which was a move away from communism, uh, which was to privatize state ownership and become subservient to IMF conditionalities. So this is what uh, caused the massive recession in Russia after, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed. It also caused this uh, for Ukraine because what it allowed was for the sharks to come in, right, buy right. everything up, and you had uh, Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs overnight who turned uh, into billionaires. They had a lot of their money in the city of London, which now you see a lot of these people are suffering from the sanctions because they were stupid enough to keep their money in right. the city of London, but Moscow on the Thames, and now right. they've lost you know, everything. They're like broke, so right. it serves them well. Um, so that's what caused that, okay? That is, that is the Western influence into the Soviet Union and, U and Ukraine that caused the Russian and the Ukrainian oligarch corruption, right. um, which to this day, you know, until maybe recently, because they lost all their money, was a, a massive problem for Russia. And uh, Moscow has never been quite fully Russian, you know, since this, this period. So Russia was able to rebuild itself, but Ukraine was not. <clears throat> Ukraine lost 60% of its GDP between 1991 and 1999, because it was beholden to IMF conditionalities. And this is right. very important because that's what we need to understand later on when we're going to talk about what was the 2014 uh, right. situation really about. So this economic hardship, this divisive history in Ukraine is what has made it really, and because of its geopolitical location, it has made it really right. vulnerable for color revolutions. So again, Ukraine becomes independent in 1991, but is not able to govern itself at all. In 1991, you have Ole Tianabuk, who founded Svoboda. This is the radical nationalist party. They don't, I think, outright call themselves neo-Nazis, but they, they publicly say right. they are followers of Stephen Bandera. Right. And right. other neo-Nazi groups also started to form in the 1990s, such as Trident. Now, you, everybody should be aware that economy is almost always tied to extremist activity, whether it's like the jihadi extremists or whatever. If uh, a citizenry does not have a future that they can look right. forward to. There, that is the biggest recruitment into terrorism. So it's actually in you know the the interest of the enemies of Russia, not Russia itself, to keep the Ukrainian people poor, because this is what uh, is allowed for this history oh, of package to come forward. Right. It's the same thing with uh, West Asia or Middle East. Right. Is right. by keeping these people poor, you're going to have uh, higher recruitment, more ignorance and stuff as to who to blame right. for why, you know, your country uh, has gone down the drain. Um, and so these torch marches that are going on in Ukraine right now, these are tied to the, the Nazi nationalist movement. Right. They're acted again like they're super innocent. They are not. Um, so Ukraine went through its first uh, revolution. In 2004, the Orange Revolution okay. since its independence, and this was over uh, the Western-backed Viktor Yushchenko and the okay. Russian-leaning uh, Viktor Yanukovych. So people, this is the thing people need to understand as well. The eastern side of Ukraine is, mo is uh, a lot of ethnic Russians. And there's mostly Russian speaking people in Eastern Ukraine, but also even in Odessa, which kind of goes like 
uh, in the southern part of uh, Ukraine. Then you have the uh, western part, which is mostly Ukrainian speaking. So the country was divisive at this point. The country wa was like 50-50 over Yushchenko and Yanukovych. So there were claims that the election process was corrupt. Um, but the reality of the situation people need to realize is that the Ukrainian people were also clearly divided. Um, and people should know that the Western-backed Viktor Yushchenko, his wife, Katerina, is the former U.S. State Department official. Uh, she also worked in the White House during the Reagan administration. <laughs> you always have these, like, Right. Very clear Western influence in this, right? right. And during the whole Orange uh, Revolution in 2004, you had people like Yavis Solano, the former NATO Secretary General, who was like basically living in Ukraine, <laughs> dealing with these negotiations, right? Right. So they had a re-election. Yushchenko became president instead of Yanukovych, and the government was a disaster. The economy didn't get better, and they weren't elected for a second term. But you know what Yushchenko did before he left? He granted Stephen Bandera the status of a hero of Ukraine. Well, there you have it. And no, uh, there's statues of him still all over Ukraine, I heard. Yes. Yeah. And I think they, they put up a lot more after 2014, maybe, or right. maybe it was just right. with Yushchenko's government. So in 2010, Yanukovych is elected. And this time there are no doubts of the legitimacy of the uh, election. And he uh, repealed the hero status of Stephen Bandera in 2011. But the, the economic situation in Ukraine was just getting worse and worse. And even though Yanukovych has his problems, this wasn't Yanukovych's corruption. This was a problem that happened, uh, uh, you know, as early, it was the perestroika that started all of this. Right. Because Ukraine, again, was one of the richest countries in Eastern Europe by the end of the USSR uh, sphere of influence. The perestroika happened, they let in the sharks, and um, they lost 60% of their GDP in like uh, six years, right? And the, they were beholden to the IMF diktat. So these are not things that Yanukovych was free to, you know, just free Ukraine from. So there's the notorious EU deal controversy, right? And right. this is what's supposed to have sparked the 2014 uh, protests. Because again, these pe Ukraine is now becoming the poorest country in Eastern Europe. And there is desperation. So the people were getting annoyed. Why is Yanukovych stalling this one-year negotiation? They want to be incorporated into Europe. They don't want to be a part of Russia, which a lot of them have been brainwashed. They don't even know their own history very well as to like what is really responsible for their situation. Um, so the reason why Yanukovych was stalling this was because the IMF was asking for a rise in utility rates, uh, foremost electricity and gas, um, with the income staying the same. The people didn't weren't even aware of what was going on, and not only this. And, and, you know, the people too should take note of this because this is now what is going on for all of Europe. Right. All of Europe is in a massive energy crisis because of this same kind of, you know, cannibalism, self-cannibalism. And uh, there's it's to the point now where food production is starting to be affected in Europe. Right. And they're so insane. They're continuing the policies and blaming, you know, Russia for the IMF type, you know, stupidity. And also there's their stupid energy policies like shutting right. down, you know, yeah. competent yeah. energy. Um, so the other problem with this EU deal was that it wanted to uh, severely limit, if not entirely shut down trade with Russia. Ukraine was dependent on trade with Russia. Again, you know, a lot, there were some Ukrainian people who were kind of ignorant on how economy works, and they thought, well, great, good riddance. How the, the jury <laughs> is out on this, right? Because what happens? You know, the 2014 protests, they won. You know, the Yanukovych government was out. There was a new government that was uh, chosen, <laughs> self-selected by Jeffrey Pyatt, Victory right. Newland, yeah. and Joe Biden. And they signed the EU deal, and now where is Ukraine? Even poorer right. than it was then. It is, like, desperately poor now. So, I mean, and then they continue to blame Russia. Like, it's so insane. Um, so, now, for my audience, the IMF yeah. is aligned with um, the World Economic Forum and the, um, and the World Bank, Bank of International mm -hmm. Settlements. 
Because I was reading that, um, and and people have to connect those dots. That this is these are the globalists that are controlling. I believe that are the biggest problem. NATO is their military, in my in my estimation. And the other thing is that I saw that in 2017. I'm sure we'll get there. They're even talking about that the Rothschild bank banks are basically running Ukraine. So it's like people don't understand that it's the Ukrainian people have been usurped. I mean, the people that still are aware. They have no idea, I don't think. No, and that's, I mean, that's the the, the problem is that they want so badly this independence, right. which right now is, is tied as it is with the baggage of the Nazi nationalist right. movement, and it's not the right way to go. Ukraine deserves independence, but they need to be smart about it. And right now it's, it's a real shit show. Um, and-